parts that are going to be hit hardest by climate change. So that means that the, the communities that are most vulnerable to climate change are also going to be the ones that are growing fastest in population. So we have to start thinking about the ways in which we can hedge this. So I hear the statistics all the time, but yeah. I hear another one that says we actually produce more food than what we need today. And mm -hmm. So it's not even just increasing production. We need to be able to even we need to do this type of research just to sustain production, right? Because of climate change, um, the environment that our crops are adapted to currently are not the ones that they're, that will be present in the future. And so we need to be able to hedge just to maintain the current production. Of course, there's a distribution problem, um, but we can't just go after one thing and try to solve that. We need to have a, whole, a more holistic view and try to attack this from all. So again, this is the digital framework that we're trying to frame this course around. And the question is, so how can, um, can the digital revolution service the agricultural revolution? And this is the, these are the topics, and this is what our, our theme will be, the theme of the course will be centered around for the rest of the semester. <clears throat> okay, so context is very important to me. There was a guy in Harvard Business Review last year who made this statement. He said it's time to think less about hackathons and more about tackling grand challenges. I personally think it's a little bit harsh, and so I'm going to just modify this a little bit. And I think it's, start, it's time to leverage everything. It's time to think both about you know, how, we can, how we can increase capabilities through apps and tools, but also about tackling the grand challenges. And so this is a nice example. This is called the GOAT Hackathon, and it happened a couple weeks ago at USDA ARS, um, trying to build open source technology for leveraging data that's in agriculture already. And this is this is Ankita, and she's the new uh, digital ag hire in computer sciences, and I think she would be a perfect <laughs> victim to help co-teach this class. Um, and so that's all the slides I've got for you guys, and I just wanted to, to again say that um, I typically would try to plan more activities <laughs> in an undergraduate class, but happy to take any questions about this lecture or my teaching philosophy. Questions? So I guess a, a couple questions. Um, one is, what kind of assessments would you do? And then the second one that you can think about as you answer that is, potential to actually have a lot of interest in this course, I think would be pretty high. And so you may end up with not just 20 students, sure. but 100 students. Mm -hmm. So then how do you think about the course? That's a good and bad problem. Yeah, absolutely. So the way I usually assess is I try to get a baseline level of understanding of the background of the students. So I do, I usually um, conduct a survey, right, the first day of course that tries to get an understanding of their background, some of the prior courses that they've taken, and then ask some of these kind of more provocative statements or questions um, about their belief system, I guess. So for the class plans, genes, and global food production, it was how do you feel about, like, from zero to 10, a bunch of questions about GMOs, basically, to try to understand, you know, their background a little bit. And then we <coughs> the same survey at the end of the course. So that's one way. And I think getting a baseline assessment is really important. You can also do some of this in the, in the middle. And of course, there are the, you know, departmental, uh, required assessments too. So I, I assume um, the faculty member will be sitting in uh, usually assessing the instructor as well. So that's another layer of feedback. And then in case um, <clears throat> so enrollment is really high, there are many methods to try to try to bring in engagement because it's a lot more fun to teach when you have engagement than just sit, standing up here and putting on a show basically. So I think clickers are great ways to engage a large audience, and um, I found that really helpful. Any any sort of um, any sort of technique to sort of like snap people out of it and have them have them do something is really helpful for engagement. So clickers are good, and then there's this online app that I used when I was in uh, teaching in West Africa, although the internet was really poor, so it didn't work as well as I wanted. It wasn't quite on the fly; it was more like so. It's called Poll Everywhere. I don't know if you guys use it. Yeah. Okay, 
Um, so I tried to use it and then it sort of took a while loading, so I, didn't, I just cut that. <laughs> um, so those are two, two techniques. If you want to write a book about digital agriculture, what kind of chapters would you include in that? It's a really interesting question because I'm currently working on a book proposal for it's got the same title as the title of this. And I was sort of, these are the questions that we are trying to figure out right now. So it's myself, Mikey Cantor, University of Hawaii, um, Brian Brown, who's a geographer at the University of Minnesota, and then a scientist at, at USC, who is actually how I sort of know one people from, I don't really know him, I just know of her through him. Um, we are trying to figure that out right now, and we have phone calls every week, and I have no really good answer, but I have open to suggestions, I guess, and contribute and uh, contributions. Although it's going to be mostly a monograph, so not a Anyway. But most of it is happy to make suggestions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So where are your so where are your thoughts on that? And you're collaborating on this. We think through that to sort yeah. of give us a feel for what how are how are the thoughts working to be able to So my thought my thinking, our thinking right now is it's not just agriculture IoT. We don't want it to be that just that. We really want to incorporate thinking about ecological concepts and trying to actually from the beginning incorporate like computer science theory to even design the questions to ask. And it's barely abstract at this point. And um, so we've been talking about a month and a half now. And up until this point, we're still trying to understand, like find that common language to speak to each other with. Um, because computer scientists talk in very interesting language. Um, so that's our current thing. We know what we don't want it to be, I guess. We don't want it to be precision agriculture 2.0. I guess if you had to design a, uh, a graduate certificate or a graduate master's program for uh, a wide audience, what would you call that program? So one idea that we've had is digital agriculture, but we think it's actually pretty limited, pretty limiting. And so your comment about uh, that you don't want it to be precision ag, you want to expand it out. And so would you have any suggestions for Title that could be attractive, um, sexy, marketing. Uh, for yet, for yes, master's students. Right, or so that you could go and uh, say, here's a graduate certificate program in this area. Um, that, uh, and we won't worry about what the curriculum is, but uh, for right now, but what would you call that? And you don't want to say digital agriculture. Uh, well, we think uh, agriculture might be a, might limit the number of uh, the kinds of students that might be in. Uh, and it could be uh, for credit or non-credit. And what's the target audience? Like, what is their background? <clears throat> so they probably, they might be uh, in agriculture, uh, but I can see them being, uh, so in some ag-related field. It could mm -hmm. be even be a machinery, or, uh, it could be uh, someone that's uh, using yield data to make decisions for farmers, but it could be someone that has actually been designed a prescription software track package that a company could use to uh, provide information to uh, their consumers. Okay. So it could be you know, through across the board. Hmm, that's a hard question. Title, coming up with good titles are really difficult. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> limiting, I think you, but we do need to qualify it a little bit after. It can't just be digital agriculture in you know, sort of isolation. Some people really do think of precision ag 2.0. Um, so I tried to qualify that in my title. What about digital food? <laughs> no, I'm actually not kidding because, Joe, are you saying agriculture might turn some people off because it's agriculture, it's not ed engineering, it's not to some extent, uh, yes, and, and I guess I uh, want to encourage as many types of in individuals to take this uh, program as possible. And, um, um, so I, I come back to the word agronomy and 
how do students actually decide to major and come to this department? Uh, it's a term that's in some cases difficult for the department to understand what that is. And yet there's great opportunities for someone who gets a degree in this yeah, general absolutely. area. Actually, I think digital food is pretty good because food is, is fairly kind of in right now. I mean, the generations that well, are coming up Well, I hope it stays in for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the generations now are more interested in food and where it comes from than ever than the generations yeah. prior. So digital food might be very attractive. Now it's the digital part. <laughs> so I guess some of these uh, students in this program in the division tend to be professionals in their areas already, and they need to get uh, additional education. Okay. So would this be like an online course? Mm -hmm. or? Okay. I have a question for you um, related to uh, just maybe your thoughts on opportunities for engaging with students and teaching on controversial topics. Um, so, uh, you know, dealing with, let's say, um, but, you know, ag focus, but, you know, chemicals that are used in ag that are of concern now, you know, obviously, you know, things like atrazine or glyphosate or increased reliance upon hormones that are used in animal production or is uh, um, your thoughts on how to engage with students in that space because students are, are, are more concerned about the environment, they're more concerned about the foods that they're eating and, mm -hmm. and those types of things. So it seems that, you know, with, let's say, the digital, um, you know, focus, then we also become more concerned with our ability to measure things. And so now we measure all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And so there's lower and lower tolerance for, you know, for, you know, for, for chemicals. So I don't know, just thoughts mm -hmm. about, you know, you know, some of these environmental, or, you know, like, it could be hypoxia, um, or you know other other things related to that. Hmm. I think that one potential method to have students engage on potentially controversial topics is to turn it into like a little debate where you assign kind of groups to to their many. They get the assignment. They're in these groups, and then they do a little. They do their research, and you know, one side is on one side, and one one group's on the other side, and then we can turn that class into a discussion. That this doesn't really work if it's two hundred but um, my experience has been with small classes, so I, I come from that perspective. But I, I really, doing it with a, with a large class is difficult. And, uh, yeah, I guess I would, um, I would start to take some training courses that are available for, for sort of the method, the pedagogical methods to deal with large classes and kind of see what out, what's out there and what techniques that are suggested by the people who do research in, in pedagogy. I, I don't have the answer to that right now. Diane, sometimes problems occur in the classroom. And so how do you deal with issues that arise in the classroom, and, and specifically two things, harassment of the instructor, or maybe other students, but especially the instructor, and academic dishonesty? Harassment to the instructor? Hmm. That's really interesting. I have not experienced that, but I guess I've been quite lucky. Um, well, harassment of any sort is not tolerated in, I think, you know, in, in, at Purdue, I assume. Um, <laughs> so harassment, <laughs> so without having any context right now, this is how I would proceed. I would go to first uh, go to my mentoring committee and ask them for their advice. Um, so if you were my mentor, I'd ask you, what should I do? Oh, if I will. Yeah. Well, I think it's important you start off probably in the class reminding the students on day one. Mm -hmm. So tone setting. Absolutely. But it does occur at Purdue. I know of cases where it's happened. We don't tolerate it, but we don't tolerate it, but still. Has and we happened. deal with it. Sure. And then Is this I think like the next stop. Students harassing or, or parents of students? Students harassing instructors. Okay. I've heard of parents. <clears throat> <laughs> but anyway, you know. Yeah. So met the mentoring committee may be one outlet, certainly, but I think there's preemptively you could deal with it. What, what about academic dishonesty? How do you deal with that? Thank you. I, so, again, with the tone setting, so I make it very clear up front that it's not tolerated. I have the consequences laid out. 
and it, there's just no tolerance for that. They get booted. But, but I mean, I think that's okay. As long as you make it clear, it's, as long as everyone is on the same level of expectations, the same set of expectations from day one, um, and one thing could mean that they sign something, you know, and they, at the start of the class, like, this is, this, these things are not tolerated, and then if it, these are the consequences if this happens, and when they sign that, it's a contract. Uh, might be a little bit tough, but I think that uh, in this day and age, they're quite used to signing off. I think your, the tone setting that you suggested is, is good. Been, it should just be a good <coughs> in terms of respect, especially the kinds of classes that you'll have could be very multi-background people coming in, and, and uh, you don't need an agricultural strain, strong person calling the computer science a jerk because he doesn't know whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, yeah. but just, you know, that, that we respect one another in the classroom. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Well, I think it's, it's kind of this funny tension these days because I think students, in many classes, they're urged to collaborate mm -hmm. on some projects, and then they get on individual activities <coughs> that they're supposed to do themselves, and they kind of forget. They